this will be really the last message that comes from this chapter. We've brought a number of them in the last few months from Romans chapter 12. There's just so much more that we could be saying there. But here we're talking about giving up our right to get even. As I put out in that email earlier, we, nobody had to teach us the uh, impulse, that desire to get revenge. But even when the little child has something taken from him and uh, they're, they're somehow has his, his rights and his pleasures infringed, there's that hand comes up and uh, I'm going to get you back type of a mentality. We don't ever lose that. We just uh, learn some more sophisticated ways of, uh, of evening the scales and, and getting the pleasure of our own revenge. And so uh, we're going back to verse 9, which starts about love being genuine. And so there'll be a little bit of review before we come to these verses at the end. Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 9, says, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. There's three of our one another messages in those verses. Bless those who bless you. But no. Sorry, let's start over. I, I wasn't looking at the words. That's what comes natural. Bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, right? Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, Give him something to drink, for by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now the earlier part of this had to do with what we refer to as anothering. And back in May 22nd, we talked about how the application of the one another's was more than just a warm fuzzy but something that was an act. And then Skip, on the end of May, spoke on loving one another and set the tone. We considered living in harmony with one another, honoring one another, welcoming or showing hospitality to one another, and being members of one another in succeeding weekends. And so we now come to uh, the transition from treating one another in the body of Christ to treating how we respond to all people, those on the outside, and finally to those who are uh, adversaries, those who bring hostility against us. But maybe the reason for going back to verse 9 is this verse, which is kind of a heading in a sense, that says, Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. A general principle there that talks about Love needing to be sincere, without hos hypocrisy. And that word for sincerity means without wax. The reason for a word that would speak of hypocrisy as being something having to do with wax, as I'm told, is that when they were working with wood and there was a flaw, there was a way to be able to cover up that flaw by filling it with wax. Only later, when the soft wax was worn out or or dissolved, did the person recognize that they've been sold a bill of goods? There is a parallel that we sometimes will 
will make ourselves look good, different than what we really are. And it'll only last for a little while. Love is to be genuine, authentic. And in a general way it says, abhor, hate what is evil, and hold fast to what is good. That sounds like just good parental advice. But that's really hard to do, to just determine our mind that evil is going to be repulsive to me. Well, fine and dandy, but sometimes evil can look pretty attractive. My wife makes really good chocolate chip cookies. Now, I'm not saying they're evil, but suppose that they were. Eating too many of them would be, for me. And uh, that doesn't mean that they're any less desirable. And, and sin has that temptation. So to hate what is, what, what is attractive to you requires that God give you a strength that you don't have within yourself. Now, I think we're going to be looking at how we can then show this sincere love. And I think that's what uh, we're going to go through rather quickly here. That uh, we show sincere love within the family of God by being devoted to one another in brotherly love. And uh, that love for, for each other. That we've considered that the church is not just a an educational institution where we come and learn facts and figures and logistics of Bible stories, but it has to do with the creation that God does within our heart of a loving affection for others that are part of His body. And being devoted to one another is to describe the relationship we have. Now we've been hitting on that quite often, but it's followed up with honoring one another, outdo one another, and showing honor, valuing each other treating each other with respect and dignity. And then we show sincere love within the family of God in the way that we work and serve the Lord. We work hard. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. The things that are necessary for a, for a healthy church to fulfill a ministry requires the participation. People that have gifts as has been described in Scripture, I mean, that, that message of the, of the toes and the fingers and how we are each one a, a member, that the church will be healthy as each part is fulfilling its function that God placed you to be in. We're, and sometimes it isn't all comfortable and easy. It takes work. The music involved planning and preparation. And there was people here at the church building today preparing for tomorrow's music to see these music. The, the nursery and, and the classes and all these things require that people are, are doing some work. And, it, and if there's nothing you can think of, and you say, well, I am a member of the body, I have to be fulfilling my purpose here. Well, let us help you. Don't feel embarrassed to say, I haven't figured it out yet. And so it says we show sincere love by the way we serve. And then when we go through hard times, praying through our suffering with a joyful spirit, rejoicing in hope, being patient in tribulation, and constant in prayer, and responding to the needy with generous help. In a practical way, and especially not just the ones we know, but the hospitality is, is the strangers, the one we haven't met. This is sincere love within the body of Christ. And then I think we, next in verses 14 through 16, are showing sincere love, not just within the family of God, but to all people, by responding to painful treatment with kindness. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Now I believe a case could be made for the fact that this could also fit within the previous, within the family of God. We'd like to say that the Christians never hurt each other, that there's never any persecution, there's never any, any cursing of, of another person. But uh, I know that I've lived, been around the church all my life, and I know that even within Christian relationships, there can be some very painful, unkind, and injurious things that one Christian will do to another. And sometimes they get into fights. And sometimes churches get into fights and, and separating the sides. And, and Satan really is victorious when he can get 
God's people, the family of God, turned inward and fussing with each other. But this, I think, is, is more responding to those who would just in the general course of, of life in this world, who might do something that would be unkind to you. And then it says, enter into, with empathy, and rejoice in the sorrows of others. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And sometimes we shift back and forth, going from one person who is, who is really uh, rejoicing in some, some new event in their life, a new baby, a new grandchild, a, a, a great day, and feeling good to someone who has just experienced a, a deep loss. But sometimes it's hard for us when the thing that they're rejoicing over might be the very thing that we were hoping would happen to us, and it hasn't happened to us, it's happened to them. Maybe you were at the White Elephant Gift Exchange and really hoped to get a certain thing to carry home with you, and someone else ended up with that and walked out the door rejoicing. Can you rejoice? Or do you just show your teeth and make it look like a smile? <laughs> Inwardly, you're not really rejoicing at all. You wish you had that, that special item. But, uh, but there's times when it's more serious than that, that we need to just enter into their life, get out of preoccupation with ourselves, and, and they're feeling sad, we need to be alongside just to um, share the load with them, shed a tear with them, pray with them, encourage them, let them know that they're not facing this all by themselves. Remind them of God's promise, don't preach at them, but, but let them know that you're there to comfort them. And so, we uh, finally can share life with, other, with others without our selfish motives coming in. That means that we're humble, flexible, and unselfish, and therefore we can live in harmony with one another. Not being haughty or proud, but associating with the lowly. Not just being nice to them, but joining with them. And, and you may have to condescend from whatever you feel is your uh, strata of society and how far up the ladder you've climbed. It says, associate with the lowly, never be wise in your own sight. Now this is instructions for life within the family of God, life with people around us. But the final verses, 17 through 21, is that we show sincere love to our enemies and gives us some things in the way we would do it. Now, that tendency and that natural inclination to get even with people. Uh, it just makes us feel a little better for the hurt if we can make them hurt too. And somehow we feel that in the universe there's this scale of, of fairness and, um, and it was tilted when they hurt us. Now we put some hurt on them and, and the balance kind of comes a little bit more even and, and uh, just seems right that it be that way. But that's not the way God tells us to do it. It says we show sincere love to our enemies by not responding to wrong with another wrong. Now we can find a lot of illustrations of how this was carried out in the Old Testament. I just sat there thinking about it and having preached not too awfully long ago about Samson. I was reminded of how Samson in Judges 15 uh, had these interactions with the Philistines and, uh, and how often he would, they would do something to him like burning down his wife's house and he would get even in set the fields on fire. And he says, I swear I will be avenged on you. As they did to me, so have I done to them. And even, uh, you know, that's, that's seeking revenge. They did it to me, I'm doing it to them. And uh, at least he put it into words and was honest. Even when Samson was dying, I remember having finally been taken by the Philistines when he gave to Delilah his secret of cutting his hair. How they took him and they gouged out his eyes, but as he was brought out into the Philistine temple for sport, uh, he found the pillars, and this is what he prayed. Oh Lord God, please remember me, and please strengthen me only this once, O oh God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. There was, there was kind of a dying prayer. Let me get even with them one last time. But there was a bit of faith in the fact that he recognized that his strength came from the Lord, and he prayed for the Lord for strength, which was answered. Or what about the prophet Jonah? In Jonah 4, 4 through 9, he's finally, after his diversions and experience with 
Let's see. Jonah has come to Nineveh, the Assyrian capital. People that he hated to preach a message of repentance, which he grudgingly did, just warning them of judgment to come, and then sat up on the hill waiting for that judgment to be inflicted on them by the Lord. The Lord, he was hot, and the Lord gave him the vine. A worm came and ate the vine, and he was miserable at the beginning. And uh, so Jonah is angry about the vine. But the Lord replied, have, the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? God said to Jonah, you have a right to be angry about the vine. He asked Jonah, the Lord asked Jonah twice, Jonah, do you have any right to be angry about this? And he says, I do. I am angry enough to die. And so we have the raw emotion of someone who's angry because they had something they felt they had a right to. God says, you didn't have any right to that vine. I gave it to you and I can take it away. But that's the way we see ourselves. Peter, in writing many years later after Samson and Jonah, said, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, there was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile and return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. Now, if I look for experiences in my own life of, of being reviled, of being persecuted, I really don't have much to think back on. I think there's probably people here in the room who have suffered more than I have. Maybe coming from people who came from an abusive background when I came and grew up in a Christian home. Or maybe people who have, are in relationships that are abusive or have been attacked or victims of some sort of violent crime. crime. Uh, we do have people who have been persecuted. I just say that I can't tell you my stories on that, but I can share with you a couple of others. John Piper, in his book, Do Not Avenge Yourself, But Give Place to Wrath, tells the story of Graham Staines and his two sons. In January 1999, Graham Staines and his two sons, Philip 10 and Timothy 6, were mobbed by radical Hindus trapped inside their vehicle in India and burned alive. The three charred bodies were recovered clinging to each other. Graham states had spent 34 years serving the people of India in the name of Jesus. He was the director of the leprosy mission in Barapada, Orissa. He left behind his widow Gladys and daughter Esther. Her response was in every paper in India to the glory of Christ. She said, a few days after the martyrdom of her husband and sons, I have only one message for the people of India. I'm not bitter, neither am I angry. But I have one great desire, that each citizen of this country should establish a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, who gave his life for their sins. Let us burn hatred and spread the flame of Christ's love. Everyone thought she would move back to Australia. No, she said God had called them to India and she would not leave. She said, my husband and our children have sacrificed their lives for this nation. India is my home. I hope to be here and continue to serve the needy. Then her 13-year-old daughter Esther was asked how she felt about the murder of her dad. She said, I praise the Lord that he found my father worthy to die for him. This is an illustration of what the scripture teaches us here in Romans 13. A similar thing happened in 2007 in Turkey, where Islamic militants mutilated and murdered German missionary Tilman Geski a father of three, and two other Turkish believers, one of whom had two young children. Geski's widow also publicly forgave the murders and vowed to continue her ministry in Turkey. You see, this is the type of response to persecution that Paul is writing about, what many Christians have done. Voice of the Martyrs magazine brings us these types of stories 
each month. It's happened in history, it continues to happen in our world today. We show sincere love to our enemies by responding to wrong, by doing what is right toward them. You see, revenge, revenge trying to get even, seeing if, we, if they kill one of us, we can kill three of them. Revenge runs contrary to what society deems to be right. Doing what is right requires some forethought. It says, give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. This verse could literally be translated, take thought in advance for what is visibly good in the sight of all people. It's stated that in New Testament Greek, there are two words that convey the idea of goodness. One refers to inherent goodness. The other, the word that's used here, refers to external or visible goodness. It means good in the sense of right, fair, noble, honorable. Well, doing what is right may not result in peace, but peace should be your aim. Getting revenge doesn't promote peace. It just incites people to more hostility. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And you may be determining that you're not going to participate in, in an altercation or in carrying on a, an exchange of unkind words. You can st stop doing the wrong. You can be peaceable and you can't control other people to make them reconcile and be in harmony with you. So that's why it says, if possible, so far as it depends on you. Now, showing love to our enemies, too, means doing good to rascals while leaving justice in God's court. Now, I started out writing, doing good to them. Well, let's call them what they are. They're rascals. They're not nice people. They're treating you in a very painful way, and they're not even caring about it. Does that make it any different? It says, revenge usurps a task which belongs only to God. We're quoting Deuteronomy 32, 35, says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. He hasn't appointed us to be his weapon of vengeance. Doing what is right includes kind actions to meet the needs of your enemy. It says instead of getting even, trying to make them suffer like they've hurt you, you want to hurt them back even a little more. It says if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Some years back, the Daily Bread devotional, which we still provide for people to use, told the story of a terrible time of atrocities in Armenia, where a Turkish soldier pursued a young woman and her brother down the street. He cornered them and then mercilessly shot the brother and let the sister go free, but only after she saw her brother's brutal murder. Later, the woman was working as a nurse in a military hospital when the Turkish soldier who had shot her brother was brought into her ward. He was critically wounded and if she had left him alone, he would have died. At first, she wrestled with the desire for vengeance, but she realized that the Lord wanted her to treat this man with kindness. So she gently nursed him back to health. One day, the Turk, who recognized her, said, Why didn't you let me die? And she replied, I'm a follower of Jesus, and he said, Love your enemies. The man was silent for a long time, but finally said, I never knew that anyone could have such a faith. If that's what it does, tell me more about it. I want it. We would like to see that happening more often. That people who see the difference, not the natural tendency to get even, but the supernatural love for enemies, who like Christ, who prayed for the people about him as he was on the cross, Father, forgive them. 
or they don't know what to do. Like Stephen, who was he with stone, says, Lord, don't take, lay this charge upon them. We might wonder, well, what does Paul mean when he says, if we let the Lord do this, we're heaping coals on your enemy's head. When I was a little boy, there was a book called Coals of Fire about how a little boy had applied this and God used his unwillingness to get even to uh, bring about a change in heart. Now there's various ideas of what, what he is meaning. You read what Red Sted Ray Steadman says in his commentary on Romans. He would say that this is the way that they had of, of helping a neighbor by sharing their fire when the fire had gone, gone out. And uh, so coals of fire on his head was giving him something he needed. Uh, most commentators say that the burning coals are burning pangs of shame that may bring the wrong word to repentance. In light of the context which urges, urges us to overcome evil with good, they argue that it could not be that our good deeds will result in greater judgment for our enemies. So it's it's just that God is going to change their heart like he did that Turkish soldier. Then there's another way of looking at it. John Piper and Thomas Schreiner, in the, in the work Christ overcame evil with good, do the same, argue that all the Old Testament references to burning coals refers to God's judgment on his enemies. Not to bring in the shame of guilt or repentance on them. In Psalm 140.10, David cries out with regards to his enemies, May burning coals fall upon them. And if that would be the case, then it would be saying here, if you do good toward your enemy and he doesn't repent, you can rest assured that one day God is going to take care of this and that judgment that they deserve will happen at that point. Well, at any rate, it doesn't give us the excuse to be the one to dump fire on their head. I personally, and and looking at it, I don't know, it's, this is just my own personal feeling. Don't see it as, as, as doing them a kind of generous act. Heaping coals of their fire on someone's head sounds not like something any of us would want to have done to us, even if it wasn't a pan. And there's other, maybe more appropriate ways, but, but it just says step out of the way. Don't try to, uh, to do what God is very good at doing. He, he is, has many more tools at his disposal to bring vengeance. And if it doesn't happen in this life, don't worry. They're not going to get away with it, and they won't get away from God. Your motive in doing the good deeds is not to increase your enemy's judgment, but to bring him to repentance. But if he doesn't repent, you know that God will bring him to justice. Watch the knee, the Chinese... A uh, man wrote devotional books, tells of two Chinese terrace farmers. The farmer whose field was higher up the hill was a Christian. He would get up early and work hard to pump water by hand for his crops. But his shifty neighbor, neighbor below would cut a path through his upper neighbor's dikes and let the water flow down to his lower field. So he was doing the work of putting the water up, and his neighbor was taking advantage of it. This happened more than once, and the Christian farmer was quite irritated with the lazy neighbor. But rather than going down and yelling at his neighbor, the Christian farmer started pumping water first for his neighbor's field, then for his own. So he responded to what was being done with kindness. Okay, I'll, I'll pump water for your field, then I'll pump my own. As the story continued, the lazy neighbor soon came under conviction, went to the Christian and apologized, and then listened to the Christian's witness about Christ and came to faith in Christ himself. And if that happens, praise the Lord. If your kindness can demonstrate a difference, that something is different within you than the rest of the world, you have that opportunity. Now some people can be so obsessed and hateful and spiteful and filled with themselves that no matter what you do for them, it still won't change them. God will deal with that person. Whatever his means will be, he's never appointed us to be the ones to bring about their justice and their judgment. He asks us 
to do as Christ did. To pray for them. To do good to them. To bless them. And then let them stand before God based on that additional revelation they've had of what He can do to change a heart and life. Father, we thank You for this passage from Romans. May we recognize that it's fine to talk about it in theory. But if someone has really done something to us that got under our skin, that wasn't fair, that, that was painful, that violated what we felt we had a right to, that we find rising from within our flesh the desire to get even. But Lord, it's not our right to get even, and so we give that back up to you in a very literal sense. May we condition ourselves to so do that, that when we feel that need, we, we just send it back up. Lord, you, you take care of that person. I, for my part, will demonstrate Christ's likeness. And may we be able to do this, and may people see Christ in us as a result. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.
He goes on to say, when you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Surely all mankind is in your breath. Whether we live a long time or a short time, obeying God, especially what this world would say is a counterintuitive and that it's not to revenge, uh, is, is one of those commands that we don't have the capacity to do, and yet the Lord gives us that capacity as we cry out to Him. We will all be given opportunities to love our enemies. And in most of those testimonies, uh, folks have kind of struggled. It's not that they just automatically do what's right, they struggle to do what's right. And we're no different. So I just want to pray uh, that we would understand how fleeting our life is, whether we're a little boy who dies with his papa, be martyred, or we live to a hundred. It still goes by, goes by just like that. It's just a favor. And so we need God's help. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit.